Today's July 30th, 2013. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the History Center, and with me is Tony Hilliard, who is also a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. We're honored to have with us today Mr. Vis Kamenis, who is a Vietnam War veteran and is going to share his experiences with us. He's got a fascinating story, fascinating life, and we're really looking forward to hearing your story. Uh, Mr. Kamenis, would you give us your full name and your date of birth? Okay, I am Viswaldis Timenis, born on the 24th of May, 1938. That was a good day, 75 years ago. Okay. And where were you born? I was born in Daugavpils, Latvia. Okay. You have a fascinating story based on what we've heard before we started this, this interview. And you brought a slideshow in a, with you about your experiences. Mm -hmm. And rather than just us ask you questions, uh, we would like you to go through that and tell your story. Okay. And, and later on we can ask you some questions, but this is such a fascinating story. We would like you to just begin by telling your story. Okay. Okay, I'm from Latvia, which is one of the Baltic states in northeastern Europe. And uh, the national colors are blood red, white, blood red, in a 212 times 10 configuration. The national uh, crest, as such, promulgated on the 18th of November 1918, is such. But, in 1944, when these Soviet tanks were in my backyard, that meant I was already behind Russian lines. And we really had to escape. So with a shirt on my back, we uh, took a horse-drawn carriage to the capital of Riga. But Riga, of course, was also being bombed and burning by the Russians. So we boarded a German troop ship, uh, troop ship and hightailed it out of there. Now, the troop ships were always maxed out with thousands of refugees and wounded uh, Germans uh, being evacuated to Danzig, uh, which is actually Poland, and then uh, further, uh, further up. Uh, we uh, ended up in Berlin and during the night, the Brits were bombing us, and during the day, the Americans were bombing us. So Berlin was in rubble. Everything was destroyed. All the, all the buildings were down, and there was just massive chaos. So when Berlin was burning and it got too hot for us, we hightailed it out of there. We took the night train to a small town of Ispringen, which is near Pforzheim on the Munich uh, Stuttgart Audubon. And on the 13th of February, 1945, this guy right here, I saw Pforzheim being totally destroyed by the Brits. That evening, Brits came in and bombed it back to the Stone Age. 83% uh, destruction. When I came out of the bunker, uh, I saw a eerie sight. From horizon to horizon, sharp uh, orange flames still flickering up as the whole city is burning, and then orange hue turning into darkness. It was an eerie sight. Okay, the war is over, we survived, and now all the refugees are herded into displaced person camps, and we're the lucky guys to be in the American zone of occupation, and we live on the dole on care packages. So thank you, America, for feeding us uh, care packages. Now, I also remember uh, in, in the displaced person camp, uh, standing in the bread line, Every day, uh, I took a number 10 can, stood in line for our daily ration of green pea soup. Now listen, 
Green pea soup, if you're hungry, is a delicacy. But green pea soup day in, day out, month in, month out, eh, it gets old after a while. So, survived the, uh, the uh, displaced person camp and was, came to the United States in 1950 under the Truman Act of 48, which allowed 250,000 East European refugees to come to the States. I immediately, uh, well, I came in with, with a shirt on my back, uh, not knowing the English language. Of course, I immediately assimilated all the customs and traditions and learned the language and became a citizen and then got educated uh, and commissioned in the regular army uh, through the uh, Distinguished Military Graduate Program from Norwich University, the Military College of New England. Then, for the next quarter of a century, 25 good years, I served in the profession of arms, protecting our Constitution, and retired as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, immediately after that, I donated my uniform and the Legion of Merit to the Latvian War Memorial Museum. But I just couldn't stay out of uniform. Here I am, I'm back in uniform, this time with a train and equip program of the military stabilization program in Bosnia. And a few years, that was joint endeavor in 1996. And then a few years later, I'm back again in uniform, but this time with the Iraq survey group. Now, we were in the documents exploitation business. We had Saddam's uh, intelligence files. So yes, I have seen Saddam's atrocity tapes and also his signature on, uh, on, the, on the assassination uh, orders. We passed that information on to the tribunal and that's what hung him. So wow, that's wow. the wrap now, yeah. okay? Yeah. Not ready. Okay. As a regular army officer, I was proud to serve in the 3rd Armored Cavalry, the Brave Rifles, under the able leadership of Colonel William Boomer, the 48th Commander. Man, that was a good time for a young lieutenant. Notice in armor, it was popular to wear these tanker's boots. So I'm one of those lucky guys who had, it, had tanker's boots. And of course, going on maneuvers. It was exciting. You learned the profession. And uh, it was, you know, for a professional soldier, that was really good. Now, of course, you have to have an image about yourself. Okay, here I am. I'm trying to improve my image by smoking a cigar. Every lieutenant did that because, you know, hey, that gives you pizzazz and so forth. So uh, I was in Germany, 64, uh, 67 time frame. And uh, Vietnam was kicking in, and uh, I was levied to Vietnam from Germany, meaning pulled out for an inter-theater transfer uh, to, to Vietnam. And uh, after some schooling, arrived in Benoit, and of course, you know, for a East European arriving in Benoit, getting out of the airplane, man, I tell you what that, Humidity and heat hit you, okay? Yeah. So we boarded those um, uh, uh, buses and went to 90th Repo in, in uh, Long Bin. And I was the lucky guy to be assigned to the 266 Supply and Service Battalion in Long Bin under the able leadership of Colonel Guy E. Stone. That guy was good. We really respected the, uh, the guy, and uh, it was very, very nice uh, uh, start. I was the uh, uh, stock control officer. Now, in Vietnam, uh, we guys in the rear did not live in tents, but we had our own atom sets. Visualize a, uh, a block of cement. Over it is built a uh, hooch. Uh, out of aluminum, and these were very, very effective uh, quarters, if you, if you will. Now, inside the hooch, uh, everybody and anybody 
uh, had, of course, a tape recorder or, you know, your, your, your uh, boom, well, wait a minute, we didn't have boom boxes in those days, but every hi-fi equipment uh, was there. And here I am, I have a left seat of a downed Huey uh, that I used as, as, as my seat in my quarters. Now, also notice that everybody had a lot of books, and I thank the publishing houses who donated so many books all over uh, the combat theaters. I saw the same thing in Bosnia and also in Iraq. Uh, donations of books to the uh, uh, troops, very, very favorable. Really enjoyed that one. And of course, you notice here, I got a P-4 crash helmet, Air Force helmet. Wherever I flew, I took that along, plugged in the P uh, PL-55 into the intercom, and I knew what was going around when we were uh, flying. Now, there was so, sort of a pizzazz about your uniform, okay? Everybody wore this uh, uh, winter, correction, summer weight uh, 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 jungle uniform, okay? And everybody, even though you had your Seco watch and your Timex, right? Everybody wore the military chronometer uh, displayed on top. And of course everybody had a K-bar on the side, meaning a dagger, okay? Uh, and then uh, you had an issue boonie hat. Now with this boonie hat you could just flop it on and it became a slouch hat, okay? Just flop it on, good to go. But if you wanted to be creative, you can play an Aussie. One side up, one side straight. Okay, so you're an Aussie. Or, if you want to do some more history, you could be Paul Revere by folding this hat into a triangle. But I play John Wayne. Okay, now, rumor has it that this is a parts 45, meaning a good armorer could go to the Ordnance Depot scarf up all the parts that go into 45 and make his own weapon off the books. But everybody was in the market for the AK-47. This is a Chinese knockoff of the Kalashnikov and uh, rumor also has it that some of these ended up in the States. Enterprising GIs would buy the large heavy AR-4 speakers disassemble the weapon, put it in the crate, and ship it out. But, surprise, surprise, the post office found out about this and started to weigh the AR-4 speakers, and anything an ounce over was confiscated. Then, in Vietnam, you remember, uh, during the monsoon season, uh, the rains really came down. I mean a deluge. Comes 4.20 in the afternoon, the sun is still shining, but you have this deluge of liquid coming down from the skies. It really saturated the ground. Even uh, tr uh, uh, bulldozers got stuck, and I mean really stuck, okay? The Long Bin Post, which is one of the largest posts in Vietnam, uh, had a large uh, perimeter, long perimeter, and these uh, V-100 vehicles were patrolling it against Viet Cong, and also the military police with their M-60 uh, uh, weapons uh, patrolled and kept us safe. Now, in Vietnam, everything and anything in supplies and logistics moved on this 1348 uh, request form. But there was so much abuse into this. In fact, this is a request for black paint, but it's also prior, uh, Combat Essential Priority 02. And it's a hand carry. So, if you wanted some item, that's the only way to get it. If you submitted a request for less than a Combat Essential item, that request got lost in route and Nine months later, if it was not filled, it was arbitrarily canceled without reconciliation. So with this document in hand, we did a lot of things. 
long bin paint was very, very popular. Every, in typical army, everything and anything was painted. And long bin paint was sort of the pukish green uh, that uh, everything and anything that needed to be painted was. Here's a depiction, as far as the eye can see, of a class one storage place. Food. This pile could feed an army for a decade. It was so much food uh, shipped in, and we were living, uh, eating good, that's what she drew, uh, in, the, in the rear areas. Uh, Frontline troops, that's another story. Uh, here's a depiction of a area 208 north of uh, uh, Long Bend, and everything and anything was there. Connexes, one on top of each other, but they already had had Project Counter 11 times where the logisticians, logisticians tried to find out, hey, what is it that we have on hand? What can we issue? And there was just massive confusion. So when Project 11 ended, yes, for that one day, you knew your status. But that same day, shipments were coming in, shipments were going out, and you just lost control. Okay? So to move the logistics scrounges came in. Okay, then I was assigned, after my uh, uh, first six months, I got command of the uh, 229 Supply and Service Battalion, uh, correction, uh, uh, company. And we provided all the logistical uh, support uh, to the 3rd Brigade, 101st Airborne, under the able leadership of Colonel Maori, another real good guy. In Fukvin, we went by convoy, protected by the uh, military police. Convoy, as far as the, uh, uh, I can see, hogs uh, flying over us, uh, providing air cover, and these M48 uh, uh, tanks providing flank security. We arrived in uh, Fukvin, which had a uh, airfield known as Bung Bung Airfield. Victor 101, and uh, it handled, the 2,000 uh, feet could only handle uh, multi-engine uh, uh, aircraft, but no jet aircraft. So here's a depiction of C-7A Caribou, which actually used to be an army aircraft, very loud inside to fly. And we also had uh, a C-130 aircraft bringing all the, all the supplies. For example, every morning, a C-130 uh, brought in ice from uh, Saigon to us guys. So hey, that was a good run. Here is, uh, they're, 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 they're pumping in uh, JP-4 uh, fuel uh, to the base. Uh, OV-1 Mohawk with the uh, side-looking radar. And of course, uh, a, a Huey Slick. Uh, on base, we had the 162nd a uh, helicopter assault company, the Vultures. Man, those young Warrens could do everything and anything with a Huey. They were good. Uh, notice that this one uh, C-123 uh, provider also uh, has the Agent Orange uh, nozzles. Uh, Agent Orange has uh, dioxin. Uh, when you lay a strip of this mist, Agent Orange mist, over a vegetation area, that dioxin uh, enhances the growth of the plants, and then they wither away and leave uh, no protection for the VC to hide in the vegetation. Uh, here's a, a photo of a, uh, a C-54 uh, Skyhook, and notice that the uh, pilots are, are, are flying ass backwards. Uh, 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 L-19, uh, forward air control observation plane, and a uh, 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 H-13 bubble. Uh, Here's uh, one with the psychological warfare guys, huge loudspeaker in there. 
and of course the famous shit hooks. What do you call them? Shit hooks. Yeah. Okay. C H forty sevens. Okay. And uh, here's an otter, and listen, this is a jewel. In Vietnam, one of the uh, fantastic innovations, besides the poncho liner, was this uh, M272 mule. Fantastic go-kart for young guys to, to drive around. Uh, here's the tactical tower in Phu Quinh, Bong Bong Airfield, and uh, a few, uh, few months later, uh, engineers built this uh, control tower. Now it just so happened that one day when I was in the control tower, the air traffic controller vectored two aircraft at the same time in different sides of the uh, airport uh, 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 strip. Okay, we did a lot of flying, uh, either um, aircraft or helicopters. Here's uh, the uh, Tonsonut Air Base. And when you were coming into Hotel 3, you always looked for these ray domes and to, uh, to uh, come on in uh, uh, landing. After that, we always visited the 506th uh, Field Depot. And this depot, listen, had everything and anything. But you had to know what is in there. So many times I just went to the depot, memorized the federal stock numbers, and uh, went uh, reconciled and started the issue uh, items from memory. Uh, many times I took a jeep uh, to, uh, to Saigon right after the uh, monsoons. And of course the uh, Saigon River uh, was patrolled by so many different styles of boats. And here's a uh, Q-boat, very, very nice, effective uh, uh, craft. Now, typical uh, street scene in Saigon, you had uh, bicycles, motorcycles, and of course this famous Lambretta three-wheeler. Uh, usually used as a taxi, but many times it could haul anything and everything. Now, higher headquarters always came to see you, okay? So here's General Jones, uh, uh, a commander of first log, coming in for a visit, along with Colonel Hawkmuth, the commander of the 29th support group, and Colonel uh, uh, Michael Del Santo, another Norwich guy, another good guy, uh, coming in for a visit to take a look. Hey, what's, what's these guys doing? But notice that I'm sporting not the regulation issue 45, but a Chinese knockoff of the K-54, the Tokar F-34 uh, model. Uh, interesting that in Fukuin we also had a Dairy Queen. We produced our own ice cream. And one of my innovative guys uh, took these ice cream uh, mix cans and mixed them in the ice cream machine in all sorts of psychedelic colors and so forth. And then we mermited those, uh, those out to the, uh, to the hungry troops in the field. Uh, uh, made, 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 made them happy, yeah. okay? Boy. Now here's a couple of guys going out to, uh, to uh, uh, patrol the area. We provided diesel and uh, notice these elephant turds. Uh, these are pneumatic 500 gallon containers, very effective for, for the jungle, okay? Uh, bringing in all, all sorts of fuel for you, okay? Everything in Vietnam ran on generators, all types, but they were very, very uh, uh, let's say, always needed fuel, okay? So uh, that was one of my main, main headaches, providing fuel. Uh, on, at the end of my tour, Colonel Del Santo presented me with the uh, green weenie and uh, the uh, um, bronze star. Green weenie, Army Commendation Medal, okay? Now, AK-47. Remember in Vietnam your tour was uh, a year, 12 months. When you were getting short a month before your DROs, you got your reassignment orders. So I got my reassignment orders 30 days before. And with that AK-47 in hand, I went to 90th Repo looked up the lieutenant 
filling out the manifests for flights. And being the wise guy that I am, I said, hey guy, this AK-47 says I'm going to be on the next flight out. Sure enough, next morning, I'm back in the land of the big PX. So along with that, I took my war souvenir. We were authorized to uh, take uh, foreign weapons out. You, of course, had to register them and uh, get the ballistics. Okay, this is now four years later. So what year would this be? Okay, this was 67, 68 okay. time frame. Okay. Now it is the 22nd of March, 1972, okay. and I last till Kissinger signs the surrender known as uh, Peace with Honor. And I depart country in uh, 12th of February, 73. We abandon everything. Here I am in, in uh, a Quartz compound, Quartz, Civil Operations for Rural Development. It was sort of a Phoenix program, Quartz, okay? And the 20 of us on MACV advisory team were quartered there. Very nice quarters. And where was this? Uh, this is on Quang Duc, Quang Duc province, okay? Quang uh, Duc in Gianea, surrounded by Cambodia, Darlak, Tui Duk, Lam Dong, and Phuc Long. Okay. Okay. So Gianea had a another two uh, two thousand foot runway chopped out of a uh, mountain ridge, and Nanko Victor Two One was handled the uh, C one thirties to to resupply us guys, okay. because we had no convoys coming in. Everything was was uh, resupplied. So our compound was uh, protected by uh, the Rade tribe of the mountain yards. Good people, salt of the earth, okay? In fact, I'm sporting my uh, initiation in the, in the tribe. So I'm a tribesman of the mountain yards, okay? Now granted, you had to go through the ceremony and drink, uh, suck, eh, rot gut out of the, uh, out of the, uh, community uh, read and so yeah. forth of rice wine. Don't, don't wish that on anyone, but hey, we went through the ceremony and it, it, was, it was good. And I'm proud and pleased that I did. Now in, in uh, Vietnam, MACV always used Air America to, to transport us. And I tell you, hats off to the pilots. These guys flying by the seat of their pants had not hundreds of thousands, but at least tens of thousands of hours behind them. And these good guys could put a DC-3, C-47, R-4D right on a dime. And they were good, uh, really good, uh, good memories for them. Okay, so that shoots the book on, on this, so let's make it a wrap. I want to go back and ask you a question about your experience after you came to the U.S. as a young person, as a child, really. You were 12 years old. Mm -hmm. Can you describe, I guess, number one, the adjustments you had to make, and number two, what gave you the incentive and the desire to go into the military? Okay. I arrived in the United States on the uh, 25th of May, 1950, came off of USS Blatchford. There was a Liberty ship that uh, transported the refugees uh, to the United States. Coming off the boat, 12 years old, I of course had all the European accoutrements, if you will. I came off with short pants on. And I had to quickly adjust because young boys did not wear short pants in the 1950s. We all wore dungarees folded up, okay? So immediately I had to assimilate the uh, American culture. And of course, since I did not speak English, I made a lot of friends to, uh, you know, get the vernacular to 
to start learning the English language. And uh, of course, at that time, uh, in the early 50s, we uh, Latvians were th still thinking of uh, maybe returning to a free Latvia. It didn't happen for 47 years, but the yearning was there. Yeah. Okay? So I fully assimilated in the uh, American culture, learned the language, uh, became a citizen. And the first day, coming out of the courthouse with citizenship papers in hand, I went next door to the FCC. Now, how old were you then? Uh, I was uh, maybe about uh, 15, 16. Okay. Sure. Uh, I went next door to the FCC and applied for my ham license because I had learned Morse code and uh, had some, uh, you know, uh, TB1 radios uh, that uh, we were kids communicating uh, and so forth. So that was my first uh, official, if you will, uh, goodness that the American citizenship uh, gave to you. Uh, a few years later, uh, I decided that uh, it would be nice to have a career in the military. Uh, tried the Air Force, didn't work out because of my glasses, and uh, Army was good because uh, you had to be commissioned, so I was looking for a military college. There were seven military colleges, not the service academies, wow. but uh, uh, private military colleges. And I was lucky enough to be uh, uh, allowed, admitted to Norwich University. And of course, by this time, I'm, I'm an old guy. I'm 21 years old, the oldest guy in class. But, of course, everybody was my friend because I could buy booze for the guys. <laughs> so uh, at that time, uh, in the uh, early 60s, uh, uh, the booze of choice was Black Label. So everybody uh, was drinking uh, Black Label and good friends of mine. So going through the road trials uh, in, in, in college, four years of uh, putting up with all sorts of harassment, if you, if you will, but that's what military academies do. Uh, I uh, aspired to the dean's list and therefore uh, was selected for a distinguished military graduate program, which gave me the opportunity to be a regular army officer. Uh, you see, regulars can serve uh, longer than the reserves of only uh, 20 years. So I was very, very privileged to, uh, to be uh, a regular army officer. And of course, my first assignment in, in uh, Germany, that was great. You know, for a young lieutenant full of piss and vinegar, we could do everything and anything because Colonel Bomer was such a good guy, you know. And I remember going on uh, maneuvers, for example, uh, Lundy's Lane 2 in Germany. Man, we were so riled up, everything's going good. I made a uh, map recon of the objective and everything looked so good. But when I arrived physically at the bridge that we were going to cross, surprise, surprise, a five-ton classification and I'm hauling 60 tons on an M60. Whoa. Typical troop leading procedures. Well, Lieutenant, what do you do now? And in the airborne, there's always a saying, do something even if it's wrong. So in the heat of battle, I tell my guys, get out of the tank. I jump in the driver's seat and ease it over the old jive and done deal. So here I am, I'm back into my command track, the M114, and I'm hauling ass up to the objective where Colonel Bomer is waiting. And surprise, surprise, Murphy steps in, a good friend of mine. If something can go wrong, it does. And it did. So what happens only 50 feet from the Colonel? I draw, uh, drop a track. But I take off my brain bucket, jump out and report to the Colonel, and I'm the first one on the objective. Now, by definition, this means that I had instant name recognition with the colonel. And sure enough, two weeks later, he invites me to join him at headquarters. So, I have arrived. <laughs> yes. Talk a little bit about your observations about the, 
your two tours in Vietnam. The, the, di the differences you saw, uh, your attitude towards what was going on and how we were fighting the war, or mm -hmm. just any observations you had because they were separated by several years yes. mm -hmm. and two different phases. And, uh, just interested in what your observations were between your first tour and your second tour. Yeah. Okay, uh, when I got my orders in Germany, uh, for, uh, was levied for Vietnam, uh, the mindset was that, hey, I'll be living in a tent for a year, being uh, shot at, eating sea rations, and, uh, and open up the sea rations with my trusty P-38. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, this jewel here, P-38, is a church key. It can open up everything and anything. Now, don't confuse it with the P-38, which is a World War II German Walter 9mm Parabellum pistol, or a P-38, which is also a Lockheed uh, a dual boom aircraft, okay? But this P-38, if you, if you were hungry, had sea rations, that opened it up for you. Okay, so Vietnam, uh, I uh, was very, very pleased, first of all, as a career officer, to be assigned to the combat zone. Because for your career, you have to have combat command, okay? And uh, I noticed that uh, 67 time frame, the Vietnamese, uh, let's say Saigon or some of the other places I were, uh, were still on bicycles and on motorcycles. That was the first tour, okay? Second tour, they were already on Renaults and uh, 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 vehicles as such. Uh, traffic jams all over. But after the fall, of course, today they're back to the bicycles. But that's another story. So, uh, in uh, Vietnam, I was a logistician, supply and services guy. And uh, there were certain issues in a context that uh, uh, stock control just couldn't keep a handle on their supplies. In the, uh, the, the official system was push-pull. In other words, you filled out a requisition. If it was not filled in-country, you went to a depot. Hopefully, a few months later, your supplies would come in before you rotated out, okay? That was long uh, order ship time, okay? The other thing was the push system. The push system set, uh, uh, allowed depots, stateside depots, to push supplies to the combat theater. And depot commanders with a storage problem realized, hey, this is great. Clear out everything and anything. So. When supplies arrived, let's say, in Cameron Bay at the Delong Pier, ships full of what? Connex is full of Mickey Mouse boots. Now, Mickey Mouse boots are Arctic boots, but they arrive in tropics. So what do you do now? All it takes is a bulldozer, you dig a hole, and end the story. Okay? So there was a lot of, a lot of this too. Now, since the official logistics system had its issues, all of a sudden in any unit came out scrounges. A scrounge is a guy who has the ability to know a little bit about the supply system, but has the gift of gab to wheel and deal. For example, a case of steak for a case of rambouille. That's good, right? Or a uh, combat weapon or Viet Cong flag uh, for everything and anything that would open up the doors. Yeah, describe what that is. Okay, this is a Viet Cong flag. Uh, uh, provenance unknown. Okay, but uh, you see there was a whole industry uh, of Viet Cong flags. Uh, you could uh, ask your hooch mate to uh, uh, manufacture your own. And with that flag in hand, uh, all the doors were open, okay? Yeah. 
uh, with weapons, uh, you could uh, you uh, you could uh, have contacts with the combat units who provided you, you some weapons, and of course we gave them whatever they needed. Yeah. So that system, as such, uh, worked. Uh, case in point, uh, I was in session with uh, Colonel Maori, the commander of Third Brigade, Hundred First in Fukvin. And uh, being the wise guy that I am, I said, Colonel, there's nothing I can't get for you. Whoa. The adjutant, Dom Ruggiero, another Norwich guy, is listening in. So two days later, he says, hey guy, the colonel needs a speech typewriter. Huh? A speech typewriter? What the hell is that? A speech typewriter is one that types only large uh, block letters, okay? So that when you type out, you, you know, you can read your speech. The colonel wants that. Well, not authorized. Third Brigade headquarters not authorized a speech typewriter. But hey, I got a ploy. I'm going to pull a fast one. So I flew into stock control in Long Bin and filled out that 1348, okay, 02 priority, uh, hand carry, but typewriters are controlled items. So what I did is I put a federal stock number for a typewriter, not the speech typewriter, went to usury headquarters in Long Bin, got a release document, went to the 506 depot and made sure that the speech typewriter is on hand. Okay? So I got just a regular typewriter, came back to stock control and turned it in as defective or whatever. So with that turn-in document, I went back to usury and said, hey, this did not work out, give me another release document, and zip, I got it, and uh, got the speech typewriter. So in Hotel 3, already uh, uh, a, a chopper is waiting for me, Warrant Officer Phelps uh, is in the left seat, uh, Captain Fellenser, another Norwich guy, is in the right seat, and we're going to fly out to, to, uh, to Fulkvin, Boom Boom Airfield. Just as we're coming out on the base leg, it's getting dark now. And all of a sudden, I see these green tracers going by the plexiglass. Man, somebody's taking a bead on us. So we landed, everything's good to go. Colonel got his speech typewriter. End of story. <laughs> <laughs> when you left your second tour in Vietnam, what was your feeling about what the situation was then, militarily, politically, and what was going to happen in the next few years? Uh, I had sort of a premonition, if you will. Uh, I was close with my, uh, uh, let's say, counterpart major in, uh -huh. the, uh, in the Vietnamese army and uh, as I abandoned post and that's what we did, yeah. we just pulled out, uh, I said that uh, within a few years uh, this nation is going to fall and I based that on observations that the Vietnamese society was family oriented, uh, village oriented but they had technically no loyalty to the national government, to the Saigon politicians as such. Uh -huh. And therefore, this is, uh, this is an indicator that uh, the whole country would fall. And they did in the uh, 30th of April, 1975. Yeah. So I, I had already that premonition, yes. Yeah. I noticed you've got Nigeria as one of your tours of duty. Could you talk about that a little bit? What you did? What your responsibilities <laughs> were? <laughs> what your observation was? So you want a war story, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was, first of all, an armor officer, then a logistician, and later I became a foreign area officer. My first foreign area officer duty assignment was to the Embassy of the United States of America in Lagos, Nigeria. Okay? and I worked in the defense attache office. Exciting, exciting work. 
because I, you know, I got a master's in political science, so I was in my field and uh, really enjoyed it. And of <coughs> course, in Nigeria, it is all what you yourself bring to the party. I had an open mind. I enjoyed what I was doing. I traveled all over uh, the country. Uh, I got to know artists and scarfed up some of their uh, good stuff and so, so forth. So uh, the Nigeria assignment was good. But interesting again, on my first day of arrival, check this out. We arrive at Murtullah Muhammad Airport in Lagos. We're met by the expediter. Everybody has an expediter, somebody to take your bags and get you through customs and all that, okay? So our expediter gets in. My first day on the job at the embassy, what is this guy doing? With a shovel and broom in hand, I'm cleaning up all the glass that's in my office because the day before that had, uh, there had been an attack on the embassy, some riot and so forth on one King's College Road at the time in, in, in Lagos, Nigeria. So that was my first introduction to diplomacy. It, it was really a good, time, uh, a good time and professionally rewarding. Uh, we met, uh, we met uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, Jimmy Carter came in, uh, 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 what? Uh, 70, 77, 78 time frame, okay? And my duty was airport security. Okay? Had a little A badge with this uh, Secret Service guys and all that. And they were all good guys. So, Air Force One, aircraft 26000 lands, and it is all the contingent comes off. And it is my duty to board the aircraft and help move the aircraft ready for immediate takeoff because that's that's the rules of engagement immediately when the president lands that aircraft is no longer air force one but we turn the aircraft around so the nigerian air force pulls up with a tow bar and again murphy steps in murphy all of a sudden as they're turning the tow bar breaks Mm -hmm. That's the only tow bar that the Air Force has. You think someone, something is not closing in on me? <laughs> but, to save the day, I have a brick radio in hand. Okay? Not a modern jewel, yeah. okay? like, like everybody has today. Beautiful capability, but in that time, somewhat 40 years ago or so, with a brick radio, I'm bouncing off the signal of the two satellites into the White House net and then I can make a call to anywhere in the world. So I call my buddy, the Lufthansa representative on Murtullah Mohammed Airport. And in German, I say, hey guy, it's time now for the Germans to save the Americans. And sure enough, the, uh, the Lufthansa comes in with their tow bar, turns Air Force One around, Save the day. So you were the hero of that day, weren't you? Uh, nobody knows nothing. <laughs> okay? <laughs> that was just a sideline. Yeah. Uh, also, also as, as diplomacy goes, uh, there was also a Latvian in the Soviet embassy. Huh. And of course he had his assignment, I had my assignment. Huh. We both lied for our government. <laughs> Did you deal with them a fair amount? Or? Uh, uh, well, that came late in my tour, so uh, we didn't have that much. But at least, yes, uh, yeah. uh, he invited me to. He invited me to the best hotel in uh, for 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 dinner. Okay, good to go. But of course, I scoped out the area first, made a recon, and sure enough, there's two Soviet guys already there, scoping out the thing. And, and typical again, poor guys, they were only drinking water while we were uh, having, uh, you know, a full steak and all that. Yeah. But hey, that, that's how, it, yeah. uh, how it's done in diplomacy. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I had a good time, yeah. Well, you had a few years between your two, two tours in Vietnam. Is there anything you want to 
share about what you did between 68 and 72? Uh, first of all, career school, okay? And then I was the only guy in class to be assigned an ROTC assignment. I became an instructor and taught uh, national security to the freshmen. And of course, uh, advisor to the Pershing Rifles. And uh, uh, it was just, just another good duty. And along with that, I had the opportunity to uh, do my master's degree out of the way. Wow. So uh, all that combination just really worked out good. When did you exit the military? When were you discharged? Uh, 25 years later, in the 1st of December, 88, I came out of Germany. Another great assignment. Uh, I, I was, uh, first of all, Director of Logistics in Garmisch uh, with the Armed Forces Recreation Center under the able leadership of Colonel Konorowski. Man, this was good duty, okay? And then my terminal assignment was in uh, uh, in uh, Zweibrücken, and uh, I just really enjoyed that assignment, and it was it was a good, uh, good uh, duty, if you will. And uh, after retirement, uh, Latvia got its independence after 47 years in uh, November '91. So a few months later, I went uh, back to Latvia and worked pro bono. Uh, at the uh, Latvian Ministry of Defense. And of course, at that time, they, they had all the hand-me-down equipment from the Russians and so forth, and uh, uh, really not that much going on. But the uh, Minister of Defense asked me to uh, recommend a, uh, a new updated, uh, let's say, first uh, reiteration of uh, computers. See, the new army didn't have, it was not computerized. So there were four, uh, let's say, uh, proposals uh, by various companies to come on in and, uh, and uh, start the, the, the computer process. And having had some experience in converting from manual typewriters to, let's say, uh, computers, uh, I knew what the bureaucratic problems with secretaries are and all that, and uh, recommended for 13 million rubles at the time that uh, the uh, new ministry uh, order from a, a British company. And the only reason I did that is because that uh, proposal had follow-on spare parts and a training package knowing from experience that if you throw just equipment at you, nothing's going to be happening. That equipment's going to end up in, 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 in a closet, okay? But if there's a spare parts uh, package, and especially a training package along with it, then that's, that's how they started. And years later in, in Bosnia and then also in Iraq, I met my countrymen who, had, you know, were in NATO and participating in uh, in uh, peacekeeping forces in uh, Bosnia, and all they were computer literate and uh, everything was good to go. So at least I had a little bit of impact. Yeah. Also, I sat on a uh, uniform board. You see, a Nuke Army had to choose uniforms. And they had, of course, hand-me-down Russian uniforms, which we wanted to get away from, and uh, logistics officers sitting in a conference in uh, 24th of uh, April 92, uh, we decided to approve uh, the current uh, uniform uh, with those oh. Polish looking hats yeah. and uh, the, uh, the rank structure uh, that was uh, pre-World War II. So we kept the history alive. Wow. Do you still have family? Uh, no, Heather? no, no. You've got a fascinating story, and I, what I'd like you to do, or well, number one, I want to see if Tony has any questions. No, I don't know. I want to just sort of open it up to you now to just fill in any blanks that you think need to be filled in or say anything you want to say, any message you want to give to people that are going to watch this. 
down through the years? Yeah. Just anything you want to say or anything else you want to share? I just thank my lucky stars that my grandmother, who uh, had experienced refugee status in the First World War by escaping from uh, St. Petersburg, Leningrad, okay? Uh, so she wow. had some experience knowing what is coming when the uh, uh, Russians took over. Yeah. So I have lived under communism and I don't wish that on anyone. Yeah. Harsh, cruel existence. And this is why under the tutelage of our grandmother, we took all the silver and gold that we had and just started our refugee um, status. And I'm thankful for that because it changed my life. Yeah. Uh, now, in, in, uh, that was my first phase, my first uh, cognitive development, okay? And uh, in Germany, uh, of course, we survived on the dole. And again, uh, hats off to the Germans during World War II. Every train station had a, uh, a soup kitchen where you could get Erzatzsuppe, in other words, uh, oh. at least some sustenance and yeah. some hand-me-down coffee uh, with, with, with wood grounds or whatever, okay? Yeah. And uh, at least we could, we could survive. And uh, again, being bombed by the Brits and the, uh, and the Americans was an experience. Yeah. I had nothing to compare it with, but at least it, I knew what fear is, okay? And of course, hey, Right late in the war, my brother and I are walking on the Audubon and out of nowhere comes, what, P-38, P-51, uh, P-47 or a Typhoon or Spitfire, I don't know. And all of a sudden they took a bead on us and started the fire where we were walking. Hey. That really got my attention. Now, was there a uh, tank in front of us or some vehicle or what? I don't know. Because targets of opportunity for the fighter, fighter pilots were, 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 were good. Yeah. They were always looking for, for, for some excitement, <laughs> if you will. I was on the receiving end. Oh, yeah. Tell us about your family. Yeah. Uh, my father died in the war. Uh, my brother, uh, mother, and uh, aunt, and cousin, uh, along with the grandmother, escaped uh, to Germany. And uh, uh, my brother now is, in, is, is a photographer in New York, huh. and uh, both got married in, uh, yeah. and have families. and. That's the story. That's great. Yeah. Well, we've done a lot of these interviews, mm -hmm. and this is one of the most fascinating ones we've done. I can tell you that. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sure Tony will. I mean, your experience is just incredible. You can make a movie out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, from my viewpoint, I definitely thank you guys for keeping the history alive because, uh, you know, we the people just need to know what our forefathers did, yeah. okay? I salute you. Well, we salute you too. Thank and you. Thank you for your service. Yes, sir.